Welcome back to the Caldwell account, folks. We've been talking a lot about Pakistan with good reason since the, uh, well, since Osama bin Laden was found and killed there. Uh, what we have discovered is that um, there are a lot of questions, actually more questions than answers about, uh, about that country. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is saying that there is no evidence that senior people in Pakistan knew that Osama bin Laden lived so close to the capital of uh, Islamabad. You might remember, bin Laden was in a, in a house the size of Maple Leaf Gardens, this complex, you know, 800 meters from a military academy we're supposed to believe that nobody knew and apparently hillary clinton secretary of state says the same we, like i said we got a lot of questions about pakistan and to talk about it we are joined from washington dc by sadnan dume uh, he is a south asia columnist for the wall street journal he is uh, an author he has uh cataloged the rise of uh, radical islamism my friend the fanatic travels with a radical islamist uh, in, from indonesia published in four countries thank you sir for being with us it's a pleasure all right uh, you've written a very fascinating piece here about whether Pakistan is a victim of terrorism. Um, and and I, you know what? I want to start with that. Is Pakistan a victim of terrorism rather than, I don't know, perhaps not such a friendly country after all? Well, you know, I mean, Pakistan sees itself as a victim of terrorism, but Pakistan is a victim of terrorism the way Enron was a victim of poor accounting standards. Essentially, Pakistan's terrorism problem is Pakistan's own creation. And, of course, the country is facing blowback from various uh, radical Islamic groups. Uh, barely a day goes by without, an, uh, with, without another suicide bombing in Pakistan. But it has to understand that these groups are operating on Pakistan directly as a result of Pakistan's own policies, encouraging and abetting these groups. Yeah, now you mentioned that in your piece, and you talk about uh, the argument that Pakistan you know, they, they blundered into Afghanistan in, 19, you know, in the early 80s after um, you know, the anti, after the anti-Soviet jihad, after the Mujahideen backed by the U.S., uh, the Soviets left, Pakistan came in, and they have wrapped themselves up with jihadists, with fundamentalists, with terrorists. So I, I would seem your, your suggestion would be to the extent Pakistan is a victim of terrorism, it's because they picked the wrong friends and kept screwing up every step of the way for the last 30 years at least. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what Pakistan has done is really quite unusual. Um, it had decided to use Islamist militants to attack Americans and NATO forces in Afghanistan and to attack Indians, the most famous example being the Mumbai attacks. And it's really a state, and particularly the Army and the intelligence services, uh, the Inter-Services Intelligence, or ISI, uh, which is, you know, deeply implicated in exporting terror uh, in a way that uh, few countries are. Uh, and and uh, this has really been the heart of the problem. The Pakistani military establishment thinks it can play both sides of the street. But I think the events of the past month show that when it comes to terrorism, you can't play, play both sides of the street because it's going to come back to bite you. Yeah, and you've got an interesting, you refer to Islamabad's double game, uh, the practice of arresting some terrorists while actively helping others. And that's what you're talking about here, the idea of trying to play both sides of it. But the suggestion I get in your piece here is that um, if, you, if you go along with, with Pakistan's game, that is to say, if you give them the fig leaf of, of, you know, what President Zardari says, that they're the greatest victim of terrorism in the world. You maybe have more chance of actually getting the results you want because you've got to give them some political cover over there while recognizing that maybe that's just all it is. It's politics, and, and, and you have to go along with it publicly, but you, you can maybe get your results behind closed doors. Does that make sense? Uh, that makes perfect sense. You know, I mean, the thing is that, I mean, we, we, you, you have to distinguish b between what would be emotionally satisfying, what would be emotionally satisfying for many people, including in Washington and I, I, I imagine in Canada, would be to, um, to, to, to point out that Pakistan has really been a source of tremendous troubles across the world, whether it's the AQ Khan network or giving refuge to Osama bin Laden mm -hmm. and so on. And so I can understand why people would just want to lash out at this country. But I think in the long term, we have to be level-headed. We have to be cool and rational about it. And that means supporting this Pakistani idea that they are a victim of terrorism, even though we know uh, you know that, that there are very clearly large holes in that argument. But you need that because we need allies in Pakistan. And the only way we're going to have allies in Pakistan who are going to fight this battle with us is if we give them what you call a fig leaf. Okay. Well, Sadnan, we're all about emotional satisfaction on this program. And I can tell you <laughs> that when I look at the aid that comes from Canada, the United States, and Great Britain over to Pakistan, and we're talking about, you know, two, three billion a year from the U.S., another billion from Britain, at least 80 million, and then other items that aren't accounted for from Canada to Pakistan. We found it, Sadnan, extremely emotionally satisfying to say no more. 
No more. For, I, for, I, go ahead. I understand that. I understand that, and I empathize with it, and I feel the same way. But I don't think that that's, I mean, what happens if you do that? Just think it through with me. Mm -hmm. What happens if you do that? Um, this is a country, whether we like it or not, which is sort of ground zero for terrorism. Um, and we need to have leverage there. You need to have people, you need to have uh, intelligence agents working there. You need to have people, uh, you need to have predator drone strikes against people in, the, in, in, in Waziristan and the tribal areas. So it's, it, it is, it, it's, it's an untenable position. I agree with that. But I think the, seek, the, the, the answer is not to cut off aid. The answer is to continue to give them aid to the degree that that gives us access to Pakistan, but at the same time, really step up the military action. Um, to tell the Pakistanis that if they don't get their act together, there will be more humiliating raids of the kind that was uh, of, of, uh, like the Abbottabad operation. There will be more drone strikes. We will challenge the army's grip on power in that country. Um, so there are serious threats that ought to be wielded. I'm not sort of, you know, I'm not saying just, you know, roll over and give them more and more money. But part of that strategy has to be continuing the aid, even though I completely understand where you're coming from on this. Okay, well, okay, can't we, can we have both? Can't we have it where we don't have to send any more money and we still c c do the raids that we need to do? Let's say Mullah Omar is in Quetta. You know, let's say he's in Waziristan. Can't we just go kill him without Most having likely, to give yeah. him a whole bunch, a whole bunch of money as well? Well, what you want to do is not make it more complicated. You don't want the Pakistan Air Force to get into sort of to 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 to, to start shooting down drones, for example. Yeah, but, but, but um, here's the point: don't they pay for that Air Force? You know, at least in part with money that comes from overseas. We talked about Afghanistan a second ago. Every time we end up giving money and 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 weapons to people, half the not every time, but they get, they get turned on us eventually as the Mujahideen became. Al-Qaeda, for goodness sake. You know, you said the Pakistani Air Force, yeah, they scrambled fighters to shoot down U.S. helicopters after killing Osama bin Laden. You know who helped pay for that? The U.S. and Canada and Great Britain. Absolutely. Great well, then why give them any more it money? Is... Just go kill who we need to kill and, and don't give them any more money. Seriously. I mean, is that not feasible? I think that we, I think we're exactly on the same page in terms of going in and killing who we need to kill. I want to do that effectively. I want to kill as many people as we need to kill. Uh, I want I want the Haqqani network to be uh, to be to, to be taken care of. I want the Lashkar e Taiba terrorist group to be taken care of. And if the Pakistanis aren't willing to do that, I think it is perfectly okay. Uh, it's, in fact, it's it's it, it's wise for America and NATO to do that. But in order to do that effectively, the, the simple question we have to ask ourselves is: Is it easier to do that by while giving them aid? Or is it easier to do that while cutting off the taps? If we were to just say no more money, no more diplomatic relations, and we're just going to start bombing Pakistan, would that solve the problem is my question. And I think it wouldn't. I think this is a delicate game. Part of the game is going to include aid, even though it's sort of I, I understand where you're coming from on that. But instead of using mainly carrots and very few sticks, I do agree that we need to have more sticks. Yeah, okay. And then no one's saying bombing Pakistan, by the way. We're saying go kill the very right. few guys. We know who they are and we know where they are. Go take care of those guys. We haven't called for any killing or fatwas or anything on this program before, but that's, I mean, with guys like Mullah Omar, we make exceptions. We got only just a couple seconds left, literally a couple seconds left. Hillary Clinton says that there's no evidence people in Pakistan knew where bin Laden was. You buying that? I think you have to say it. She, and, and to be fair, she's been much more careful than that. What she said is, there is no evidence that senior people knew. Okay. Um, it, there's no evidence. Um, maybe that evidence will emerge when, as we analyze what's been found in Osama bin Laden's house. But for now, I think that she may well be right, but it's also the, the, uh, the intelligent and politic thing to say. That's that figly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Sadman exactly. Dume, thank you so much for joining us from Washington, D.C. Great stuff, sir. Please come back. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Cheers. We're back to talk about a local story, something that you know this program's honked off about. We're going to talk about someone in Chicago. It's a thing. Return to us on the Caldwell account.